Okay, yeah, right. <clears throat> All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I've switched to English because, um, um, yeah, well, maybe there our friends in Frankfurt and Paris and London are already uh, 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 listening in. Uh, welcome back. Um, it's very interesting. Well, it has been a very interesting discussion so far, I think. Uh, and hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion uh, the, the coming afternoon as well. It's a pleasure to host this event. And um, we're going to talk about a very important topic today. Uh, how to reinforce Europe's global competitiveness in an uncertain and changing world. And to get the ball rolling, uh, we're very happy for a next guest to join us today. He's the former NATO Secretary General. He's a former Minister of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands. He's now Professor at the Leiden University on International Relations. Please join me in welcoming this great and distinguished guest, Jaap de Hopscheffer. And we're checking if you can go Thank live. You. Yeah, I'll, do you this. I'll do this. Okay. Yeah. One minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's a long minute. <laughs> it's a long minute. Yeah, all right. <laughs> This is, this is the reclame, yeah. <laughs> Commercial break. I think we are it. Yep. Yeah. Are we live? We're live? Yeah, you can start. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. Who does not remember, I would like to ask you all, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union a few years later? It was the time to start a long and well-deserved geopolitical holiday, we thought, on this side of the alliance. The liberal international order had come out victorious. History had ended, so why not relax? Francis Fukuyama thought. President George H.W. Bush thought. We thought. I thought. And the comforting maxim in Europe was, as it had been since the birth of NATO in 1949, when in trouble, call the White House. <laughs> As we Europeans did, by the way, in the 90s, after genocide had been committed in the Balkans. As we all know, not America's, but Europe's backyard. Fast forward now 30 years. The European Union, a financial economic giant, a political adolescent and a military pygmy, struggling with its role, Realizing that holiday is over, but uncertain how to prevent becoming the nut in the geopolitical nutcracker handled by China and the United States. And the question is, what does the European to-do list look like to prevent this from happening? First of all, my recipe would be to be more tough on trade and industrial policy. When you qualify China as a systemic rival, one can argue about the systemic, but a rival China definitely is, you cannot leave it here. I can understand that the European Union Competition Commissioner, applying existing rules, blocked the Siemens Alstom merger, but serious competition and a geopolitical level playing field demands a new and different approach to industrial policy where so-called, quote-unquote, European giants should not be rejected out of hand. 
This is as relevant for the competition from China the European Union is facing as for the way our American friends operate in this domain, usually by tweet. <laughs> America first, you Europeans by American. Think about all the new here. This is about building trains and cars, certainly, but it is as important to compete with Chinese and American digital technology and artificial intelligence. Controlling and coming up to speed with what has been dubbed the weaponization of data, both in the civilian and in the military domain, will be crucial. Let me applaud in this regard recent comments made by the chairman of the European Roundtable of Industrialists, Karl Hendrik Svalbach. I have two reasons for doing this. First of all, because of his plea, recent plea in the Financial Times, to invest more in European jobs and innovation. Secondly, because the debate about Europe's geopolitical role and weight will profit from active participation of the corporate sector. I spoke about being tough on trade. The European Union could do with some more self-confidence and self-esteem here. A market of 500 million plus, still including the United Kingdom, which has not yet finished its voluntary political suicide, a market of 500 million plus is as much in a position to tell China to abide by the rules as are the United States of America. On one condition, though, that we Europeans do not fall into the bilateral trap the Chinese and, to a certain extent, also the Americans under Trump are setting up for us. Why do I say this? I say this because both the Chinese and the American presidents much prefer to do business with individual nations and not with the institution European Union. And that spells danger, as we have recently seen in Italy when that country bilaterally dealt with China on the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. And we see it with President Trump bullying Germany on a regular basis and threatening its vibrant and competitive automotive industry and export. For this reason, it is essential that the European Union develops a long-term and integrated China strategy, which is at the moment non-existing. Long-term, because China thinks in decades, not in years. Integrated, because China thinks and acts completely integrated in all its policy domains. Take BRI as an example, it is impossible to distinguish where politics ends and economy begins and vice versa. And a third element worth mentioning when you develop a China strategy is China's centralism. A party which is more powerful than the state, no distinction between public and private, between state and private companies. Post-totalitarian surveillance, no individual freedoms. Ask the Uyghurs, the Turkic Muslim people in Xinjiang province. I realize that developing a comprehensive China strategy will be far from easy, but will force us to look at Europe's position in the world and the choices facing us through a more geopolitical lens. Quite a challenge for us Europeans because we will be sailing uncharted waters given Europe's angst for geopolitics. But remember the nutcracker. There's another leader ready to use it, and he sits in the Oval Office. President Trump is, in my view, more a symptom of the Indo-Pacific trend in United States foreign policy than a clean break with the past, but that is slightly beyond the scope of my short talk today. Where I do agree with the President, President Trump, and that does not happen very often, is where he castigates us Europeans for seriously neglecting our commitments in the realm of defense. The economic giant is still a military dwarf who thinks he can ring the White House doorbell whenever in trouble. <coughs> and here, ladies and gentlemen, the European Union should start to take itself seriously. Yes, in a scenario which could lead to invoking Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and you know it, an attack against one is an attack against all, I'm confident that the United States would act. But I can think of a few scenarios where the United States would rightly say, over to you guys. In other words, a European Union claiming a role amongst the big ones, which is what we should do, should be able to project hard military power when the situation so demands. And I add, 
In these Trumpian times, the European Union cannot afford to be tough on trade while being soft on defense, for the simple reason that the United States president links the two. We cannot tell the Americans that we Europeans are the best allies they have, which is a truism, while at the same time not being able to defend ourselves. We are facing a credibility gap here, which should be filled as soon as possible, were it only for the reason that Americans and Europeans need each other, encountering China's ever-growing political and military clout. French President Macron has understood this in launching his so-called European Intervention Initiative on bringing the able and willing together to create a serious European military capability to be used when necessary. I hope that we can keep our British, or should I say English, friends fully engaged in this domain when they have the Brexit drama behind them. Same goes for Germany, which could and should have a much higher profile in the defense domain, and hopefully in other domains as well. Talking about France and Germany, I think we all realize that the European Union can only become a serious geopolitical player and actor when we hear a coordinated narrative on its functioning and its future from Paris and Berlin, which at the moment is unfortunately not the case. China and Russia, and yes, the United States of America, are ready to cash a divided Europe as a strategic price in the 21st century great game of geopolitics we are witnessing today. It's a complex game where we are confronted with more classic elements of territorial dominance, like the unlawful annexation of Crimea, China's so-called Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea, claiming sovereignty, as you know, all over this vital artery for international trade. But what has been dubbed as the geopolitics of technology, like, as I mentioned, the weaponization of data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and I say again, in both the civilian and the military domain, are, in my opinion, as much part of this great geopolitical game. And also here, Europe cannot afford to play only second violin. Why are we Europeans so behind on 5G technology that the Chinese are now in the position that they can divide Western alliances? Or, as the FT yesterday quoted Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, China, Mike Pompeo China, is in, China is in a position to divide us on bits and bytes. Ladies and gentlemen, I cri de cœur in conclusion. In defining and securing Europe's position in the 21st century, in that world through the unique project with this European Union, we must realize that what I would call societal issues, like migration and income distribution, are as much driving risk and uncertainty as the rise of China or the tweets of the American president. The resulting dissatisfaction with the voters is, as we all know, often directed against the European project. So to prevent a situation where the Union becomes the nut in the Chinese US cracker, defending it in the national political domain is as important as forging a coherent China policy, dealing with an assertive Russia or trying to read the Trumpian tea leaves. Because at the end of the day, to quote the words of Tip O'Neill, a former speaker of the US House of Representatives, at the end of the day, all politics is local. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Hoop-Scheffer, for those excellent introductory words. Uh, my name is Rem Korteweg. I work at the Klingendal Institute, and it's an honor to moderate this session with four excellent speakers. Now, the title of our session is How to Reinforce Europe's Global Competitiveness in an Uncertain and Changing World. And I think it's, it's a credit and, uh, to the organizers and a testament to the changing nature that Europe finds itself in that they've invited a former NATO Secretary General to kick off this discussion. Um, in a way, this is a panel about where we stand currently in this geopolitical and economic transition moment. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce four speakers that will uh, shed their light on this, uh, on this particular European condition. 
In a way, before I get to those four speakers and give them the word, in a way, I'd like to paraphrase what you're describing, Mr. de Hoopschreffer, as the big squeeze. The big squeeze that Europe finds itself in geopolitically, on trade issues, economically, but also perhaps politically, as we see the rise of populism and Euroscepticism in European countries forcing um, centrist politicians to make very difficult choices. And what I'd like to hope, uh, what I hope we are able to do in the next hour or so is to take an outside-in approach. First look at what are the external challenges Europe faces, continuing the discussion that you started, Mr. de Hoopschreffer, and then zooming in also on how European politics are changing and whether we can address the challenges that you so rightly lay out. So after your keynote, uh, and I think we listened very attentively, I would now like to ask our three other panelists to give their short introductory responses. And first of all, I'd like to mention who our three speakers are. It's Reinhard Butikofer in Frankfurt. He is a member of European Parliament for the Greens, a very well-known figure inside the European Parliament and out, very active on trade issues as well. Then I'd like to invite Ms. Michaela Markusen, the chief economist at Société Générale in Paris, to offer her perspective. And then finally, Professor Simon Hicks, Professor of Political Science at, uh, at the LSE. And so without further ado, um, I'd like to ask Mr. Mr. Butikover, continuing Mr. de Hoopschreffer's analogy that Europe is the nut inside the Chinese-American nutcracker, how does it feel being in the nutcracker? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, I must confess that I'm afraid I will be more optimistic than uh, I might be expected to be. Uh, but I really believe that um, the European Union has already started to move beyond just waiting to be cracked. And uh, I would argue that if you look at different policies that we have been pursuing vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, notably uh, the anti-dumping measures that we put in place, the uh, measures to screen sensitive foreign direct investment, the uh, connectivity strategy, or look at the uh, latest EU-China summit where the European leaders managed to strike a new tone. I think Europe has begun to understand that it has to get its act together and to get moving. And it has already begun moving. Uh, I would say then that Europe is better in that regard than its public image is. However, there are, of course, these external challenges, and these external challenges are exacerbated by internal divisions. Uh, Mr. de Rupschäfer spoke about Italy uh, signing a, an MOU with China over the Belt and Road. Well, Italy did sign that MOU, but on the other hand, Germany and France did the real deals uh, with the Chinese. Uh, and I think uh, it's as often is the case, if you put your finger, at, point your finger at somebody, three fingers are pointing back at you. Uh, so I think it is up to us to understand that all the nations have to start, and, and particularly the strong nations in Europe, namely Germany and France in the first rank, have to start acting as European powers and not just as representatives of a narrowly defined national economic interest. And that also applies vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. I recall that last year Mrs. Merkel went to the White House uh, trying to convince President Trump to um, lower the tensions on trade. She came back empty-handed. And the same happened to President Macron. And only when President Juncker went in July, uh, I think he succeeded. And uh, I would consider the deal that he did with President Trump as a real struggle genius. And he proved to the, to the Americans and to us that Europe acting together can indeed play this role and we're not confined uh, to being a nutcracker, uh, uh, to be the, the, the nut and the cracker. But of course, we also have to play offense. And that's maybe a, a point I would like to add to what the 
uh, Sekjen said um, about where we have to look. I believe that uh, an, an activist European policy is as much about defining a coherent European industrial policy that drives innovation, that drives digital and uh, eco-innovation and social innovation, at least as much as defending against unfair trade practices from the Chinese or from the U.S. President. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the real game is about overcoming the internal, the internal divisions and overcoming the, the laziness, I might say, that we still see uh, in some uh, capitals. But when I look at major business organizations like BDI, the German Federation of Industry, they came up with a brilliant um, China, China strategy paper, which at the same time qualified as a strategy paper for European industrial policy. So I think there everything comes together. Th th thank you very much uh, for, your, for your thoughts, uh, Mr. Butikover. If I can paraphrase, what you're effectively saying is that, yes, we might be the nut, but the glass is actually half full, where there is already work being done. I'm just mixing or, my or, metaphors. Or the nut is or, maybe uh, also a, a, a nut of steel, maybe. A nut, a nut of steel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see how far we can take the analogy can, this we afternoon. Can rule <laughs> <laughs> um, but turning over to you, Ms. Ms. Markison, uh, you, you look at Europe primarily through a, 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 an economic and a financial economic lens. And I'd like to uh, um, ask you specifically uh, what, wh whether you think that Europe is up to this ambition that I think both Mr. Dobschefer and Mr. Mr. Butikofer share of making Europe that more credible global actor. And, and in your view, what does that mean for the role of the euro? Uh, and can that be strengthened, or are we simply um, kidding ourselves? There's no... That's a shame. We're not, we're not hearing you. I don't know if there's anything we can do. Yes. So it's still not working? Yes, we're hearing it now. It's working? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so basically I think if we, if we start off with something a little bit positive, it's interesting to notice that it was really only when the U.S. went in on the Iranian deal that Europe woke up and realized how powerful a tool the U.S. dollar is. The U.S. dollar allows the U.S. an amazing reach when it comes to implementing its geopolitical goals. And it was at that time that Europe woke up and for the first time stated an ambition to create an international role for the Euro. So I would say that was actually quite positive. On the other hand, I also feel it's a little bit of a shame that we have to wait for something like that to happen for us to wake up in Europe. So it's sort of on the one hand good news, on the other hand it's bad news. But you start off by saying that, that my vantage point is economics, and that's very true. And what worries me as an economist looking at the world today is that we really came from a, a multilateral framework. And that multilateral framework was at many different levels. It concerns trade, concerns geopolitics, military. But I would also argue that the multilateral framework concerned something really important for, for us in the financial sector, and that was crisis management. If we look at how the previous financial crisis was managed, it was very much through cooperation, and also in, in defining a future regulatory framework. And I think what we need to worry about today is if we go into a new crisis, will we be able to manage that in a collaborative approach? Or will it be a question of everyone trying to build the bed, bed sheets towards themselves? And along similar lines, I would say that in the regulatory space, are we in danger today of moving towards more fragmentation, where each country or each zone is setting regulation to optimize its own agenda rather than cooperating? 
And my concern is that we are moving towards this more fragmented uh, global order, and that in that context, Europe really has to move away from being what I think can be fairly termed a political as adolescence, as we heard in the initial speech, to, to becoming an adult. So I've been trying to think about what does it mean to be an adult? It's, it's not easy, but I think if you, if you really want to be an adult, you have to have a clear vision about what you're doing. And I think this is the most important challenge for Europe today, to decide what is it that we want to be. There is an awful lot of ambiguity within Europe. We're not quite sure, do we want closer cooperation? Do we not want it? We're always sort of hesitating. We leave a lot of ambiguity. And, and I think we can no longer afford that. So I think we need to have the courage to build a, a new vision. I think we have every opportunity to do so. And just, you know, to think about it, we're starting from a really strong point of fantastic assets. And um, I was looking, uh, and I won't read them all to you, because I was, I was just looking at the European institutions. We have an amazing set of institutions, you know, with the Council, the Commission, the Parliament, the European Court of Justice, the Ombudsman, um, we have the ECB, the ECA, and I have a long list here, I won't read them all to you, but we have a very strong set of institutions, but I wonder, do our populations know these institutions? We also have very strong social and welfare models, do we always appreciate them? And we have a wealth of experience to show us what works in these welfare models where we can really learn from each other. We heard this morning that Europe is a leader on climate change. We can use that to our advantage. And on top of that, something we haven't mentioned really directly, we did touch slightly upon it before lunch with the question of immigration, but Africa is on our doorstep and could be a fantastic opportunity for Europe. Should we really be letting the Chinese take over in Africa or should we be stepping up to the plate and doing something? So I think we have tremendous opportunities that we can work on. <clears throat> But I think the way forward has to come from a vision because I go to a, I have the pleasure to come to a lot of conferences. I haven't been to a single conference yet where someone said, no, you know, let's walk away from it all and forget about it. But there's something missing in our ingredient. And to my mind, it's that vision that we can share with our populations and we can embrace it and move forward. And just as a, as a concluding thought on this, you know, if you think about what is a populist? A populist is someone who's promising a romanticized return to the past, you know, probably a past that never existed. You know, what is it about take back control and Brexit? It's some kind of romanticized vision of taking back, back the UK maybe to the 1950s. How is that good? You know, at that time, 3% of the population had a refrigerator and there was food rationing. Um, I don't think that was a very exciting time. You know, make America great again. It's again this romanticized vision of the past. But if you tell someone who's lost their job to a robot and is now being competed in their new job in the service sector, maybe from an immigrant, that we're going to do more of the same, um, I'm going to say no thank you. So to me, that's really what we miss today is this idea of a strong vision for Europe. Okay, th th thank you for that. I, I, I hesitate to, to give the floor back to Mr. Butikover, who I'm sure, and, and I'm sure that the Greens have a particular vision that they uh, are putting forward uh, now that it's campaign season. But before I go back to the other panelists, I want to give Simon Hicks an opportunity to chip in and, and, and also Mr. De Hoop Scheffer to respond. Um, <laughs> Professor Hicks, uh, you study the European Parliament in depth. You, understand, you have a deep understanding of the European institutions. Um, we've heard the previous speakers lay out sort of an agenda uh, of what we need, what Europe should be delivering for its citizens. Um, is that realistic given what we are likely to see coming out of the European Parliament elections and the new commission? Thanks very much. Um, as you say, I, I speak here today not really as a Brit. It's, it's odd that I have to make that clear at international conferences I speak at now. I speak here as a scholar of the European institutions and a very passionate supporter of the process of European integration. Um, and I'm very worried about where we are right now and where we're heading. Uh, I actually, following on from the previous speaker, I see two 
different visions emerging, and I think it's a little too uh, simplistic to just describe the populist vision for Europe as just a harking back to the past. I think it's been evolving, uh, and you can see, for example, the traditional vision for Europe is one of freedom and emancipation, both internally and externally. So internally it's about removing barriers, opening up more opportunities for free movement of goods, services, capital and labor as a, as a, as a vehicle for generating growth and prosperity. Um, of course, with a safety net and minimum standards in environmental and social affairs and, and reinforcing existing welfare states, but also externally a vision of freedom of, of global markets and free trade and the EU being at the forefront of promoting globalization, uh, the WTO and global markets, and really uh, preferring to exercise a soft power globally rather than a, than a hard power. So you can think of that as the traditional vision or the established vision of the process of European integration over the last 20 or 30 years. The populist vision is emerging as one around the theme of protection, a, a protectionist Europe. It's not in the sense the populists are not necessarily anti-Europeans anymore. They're pro-Europeans in a different sense. What they want is a Europe that is a protectionist Europe, uh, both internally and externally, protecting Europe against a dangerous world, uh, protect, closing Europe's borders to immigration, uh, protectionist international trade policies, trying to exercise a hard power, potentially, uh, it, particularly in our, our part of the world, but also protection internally, uh, and, and here bringing back powers to nation states to protect themselves against the process of, of European integration internally, uh, potentially unraveling what we've already built in the area of, of uh, in the Eurozone, and also unraveling what's been built around Schengen. So in a sense, we're almost at the cusp of this point, and, and what I see coming in the European elections is really a battle between these two alternative visions of where Europe is heading. And, and if we read and look across at the current opinion polls, you can see uh, a, a big shift, I think, in representation in the European Parliament for this more protectionist vision of Europe, a more populist vision of Europe from the radical left and the populist right. Uh, we could have at least between 35 and 40 percent of the seats in the next European Parliament could come either from the radical left or the populist right. We're going to see a much smaller centrist pro-European bloc. Uh, for the first time, we'll see the, the EPP and the S&D, the Grand Coalition in the Parliament, fall below 50 percent of the seats. We'll see coalitions inside the European Parliament be much more difficult to build and maintain stable coalitions inside the European Parliament. So immediately we'll see that play out in terms of formation of the next commission. I think it's going to be quite difficult to get a uh, commission president of one of the two big party families through. Uh, there will have to be a package deal across all of the political institutions and presidential offices that are up for grabs. Uh, the, the, the difficulty, of course, is that will be seen as your classic centrist European cabal of the EPP, the Christian Democrats, uh, the Social Democrats, the Liberals, and perhaps also the Greens. That's playing into the hands of those to say, see, we told you, they're just a self-interested, centrist, pro-European cabal, like ruling against the will of the people, which is questioning a lot of fundamental elements about this project. And then moving forward to think about the ag policy agenda of the EU going forward, I think we will see uh, politicians and parties from some of these movements taking on some significant roles. They will be significantly represented in the European Council with uh, Polish law and justice, with Orban, who I expect to leave the EPP, of course with Lega and Five Star Movement in Italy. You can see representation at the highest level in the European Council, in the Council of Ministers, a big bloc in the European Parliament, perhaps getting some key committee positions and rapporteurships in the European Parliament. It's going to be a very new world in which to think about how to try and shape policy going forward in the EU. Th thank you for that. That's a somewhat sobering assessment. Um, I, I'd now like to give um, Professor Hope Scheffer the opportunity to pick up on some of the points that you've heard raised in response to your, to your keynote address, um, and perhaps push you a little bit and, and, and ask what would be sort of the, the key two, three things that the new commission should really take on board, despite some of the difficulties that Professor Hicks mentioned. I mean, let's assume that there will be a, 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 a next commission. What, what should be the two, three priorities that they should really sink their teeth into? I, would, I, I, think, I think in answering your question, I would, I would not start with the Commission, first of all, uh, because I, th I think the burden of responsibility now really is uh, and should be with the heads of states and government. 
Uh, they have decided already a number of years ago, we are the crisis mechanism, we are the ones who are calling the shots, uh, and this is not a plea ag against the Commission at all. Uh, they, they have to take uh, Europe uh, in, in their own hands, and as, as Professor Hicks was rightly saying, that will become more difficult. Why is it becoming more difficult? The European middle, political middle ground, has itself to blame, because you see in many countries, including this country, the Netherlands, uh, the traditional parties, who all stem from a, from a pro-European tradition, uh, have thought, well, if we put a few populist feathers in our cap, or on, on, on our cap, we might attract more, more voters. Uh, and they have been, not been honest to their roots, not been honest with themselves. So, I mean, the European political middle, and I define that middle quite, quite widely, has, has, itself, has itself to blame. So I do think, uh, uh, and, and there is a declaration from Sibiu in, in, in Romania, which is fine, which is nice, uh, uh, but these are up till now words. And when I say the European Council, as I said in my, my, my brief introduction, uh, I really think that France and Germany, President Macron uh, and Chancellor Merkel, and who knows, uh, uh, a new Chancellor, if that's Madame Kram Karrenbauer or, or any other, it is up to the Germans, up to the CDU, to the CDU CSU to decide that they get their act together. Because you can speak about Hanseatic coalitions here in the Netherlands, you can try to form different alliances. When there is a different narrative from Berlin and from Paris, it will not work. It will not work internally, as, as, as Professor Hicks was, was, uh, was an analyzing the top jobs. Uh, it also will not work externally, uh, uh, and a European Union which I want, and which I want to survive geopolitically, vis-à-vis -vis the Chinese and the United States of America and an assertive Russia. Uh, I noted, by the way, in, in preparing this, this little talk that I could not have imagined, uh, I think six or seven years ago, that it would be, it would be an introduction of almost equidistance between, between, uh, between China and the United States. All right, we still have NATO, we still have solidarity, we still have Article 5, but I, I could not have imagined myself uh, giving such an introduction uh, uh, in, in before Trumpian times, uh, and let, let's hope that Trumpian times uh, are, are ending earlier than one might expect, uh, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm not so certain. So my, my, my answer, answering your question, uh, Ram Korteweg, is, is uh, uh, the narrative in Berlin and the narrative in Paris. Uh, Macron, and, and then I ended not for nothing with Tip O'Neill and all politics is local. Macron had wide-ranging ideas, but he also had the Gilets Jaunes, uh, his, 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 his yellow vest, which all politics is local, which limits uh, the, the ability he can put the, uh, the European Union uh, en marche, uh, to use his expression. Uh, and I must say, as, as, as I said politely in my, in, in my speech, uh, I, 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 I see a certain how shall I phrase this, a certain paralysis in, in, in Berlin, in Germany, I don't like because I, I think that Germany should and must, must be at the forefront, not only in the realm of defense, but in the, in the realm of ideas about the future of, of, the, of the European Union. Uh, but again, I end where I started, nothing much will happen, be it internally or externally, if we do not hear the same narrative from Paris and from Berlin. Um, and by coincidence, we have a German and a French participant. So we're going to <laughs> continue this, this uh, un unpacking the Franco-German motor, if, if, you, if you will. Um, Mr. Butikofer, uh, you are a member of the European Parliament, but you also carry a German passport. Uh, could you comment on not just what Mr. Dobschefer said, uh, this appeal for, for, for German leadership, but also perhaps addressing Ms. Markison's point about this necessity of a vision. And I already kind of hinted at that. I'm sure that you as a, as a, as a Green Party uh, uh, member will certainly have a vision for Europe. And, and also, if I can pile on, um, Mr. Hicks's analysis that it's going to get more difficult in the European Parliament. Um, so I think, I think we, we should listen to you for a minute and, and, and get your insights on where things stand with respect to Germany, but also with respect to the European Parliament. Please. Thank you. Campaigning as I am at the moment, I do not 
uh, allow myself the luxury of pessimism. And even if I was a pessimist of reason, I would still insist on being an optimist of will. And I am a bit disappointed by what uh, Professor Hicks said, um, painting in the darkest of colors what's coming up. There will be a major change, a mon monumental change in the European Parliament, that's for sure. But I would not describe that as a dissolution of the centre, rather as a reconfiguration of the centre. The um, two former mainstay, par mainstay parties, EPP and SND, will get weaker, but Liberals and Greens will get stronger. And I am completely convinced that we do own the capabilities and the insights that will allow us to uh, um, chart a course forward. Uh, my vision is um, threefold, uh, I might say. One is built on the, um, um, the famous um, Kantian vision of uh, perennial peace, where he describes globalization of democracy and globalization of exchange, cultural and economic exchange, as the two pillars of a uh, global order of peace. I share that vision, and that's why I'm uh, supporting the concept of multilateralism. I just read an article by Professor Mearsheimer, who argues that the liberal international order was bound to fail. I don't agree at all. And I also, sorry, um, Secretary General, I don't agree with your statement of uh, equi equidistance. Uh, I don't feel that way with regards to the Chinese or the Americans. I think we sh still share a lot more, notwithstanding that we don't like the President in the White House. Um, so I, I believe that uh, the second element of the vision is the necessity to transform our economies and our societies to live within the borders of global, global sustainability. And the th third vision is indeed, Professor Hicks, about protection. I refuse to accept the um, equation that protecting is uh, the same as protectionism. When we protect European industry against unfair competition, that is not protectionism, that's just creating a level playing field. When we insist on protecting people, protecting um, uh, small businesses, protecting um, uh, people that are jobless, unemployed, against uh, an unfair development of globalization, I don't think that this is something that we should reject as a negative notion. I agree with President Macron when he says that, yes, Europe should be a factor of protection. And I do think that the nationalists and the authoritarians that you spoke about are trying to shape their concepts of protecting in the framework of nationalism. And that's a major difference to them. We think that there is only a way to establish European sovereignty on the big issues. And we cannot dream of recreating national sovereignties on issues like climate change or international peace. Uh, that's, uh, so they tr try to transform the EU and to make it into a club of nationalists. But that's their weakness also because they are not understanding the lesson that uh, Paul-Henri Spack told us many years ago when he said there are only two kinds of countries in Europe, the small countries and the countries that do not yet know they're small. Now we're learning all of us are small, but together we're really uh, capable to be very powerful. And we see that in the trade, um, um, in the trade sector, and we can also do that in other sectors. I do believe that we can also grow up with regards to security. So protecting is an element of the vision. It's not the only part, but it should be integrated. Can, can I just follow up and ask you, Mr. Butikover, 
um, regarding Germany's position in, in, in this new uh, institutional cycle. Can we expect a more uh, sort of proactive uh, Germany on these more geopolitical uh, topics? Um, is, is politics in Berlin able to deliver on that um, demand that we see not just here in the Netherlands, as expressed by Mr. Daubschreffer, but you saw it in, in, in various formats uh, in various countries uh, over the past couple of months, this appeal for Germany to play that stronger role in terms of making Europe more coherent and credible. I agree with that. I, I do believe there cannot be any type of European Weltpolitik Fähigkeit, as Jean-Claude Juncker said, no European capability of being a global political player without Germany understanding that it has to contribute to that effort. Presently, German politics has grown stale. And I really believe that there has to be a new, a new opening, a new impetus, a, a new start, a fresh start. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a, a major um, new departure being delivered by the present German government. So they're, they're just waiting for their opportunity to uh, uh, run from the coalition that they uh, feel themselves forced to uh, stick with, even though uh, either side hates the other. Um, I believe that Germany, in order to play a new role, just like France with President Macron, has to uh, also find the, the, the courage to come up with a new internal combination of forces. Otherwise, uh, we, we tend to be a blocking factor, I'm afraid. And the Greens, I might add, might play an important role in this, given where public opinion poils po public opinion seems to be pointing towards. Um, can I now turn to Ms. Markison? Um, you're based in Paris. Could you, could you reflect a little bit on uh, the role that Macron and France are playing in this new Europe? And perhaps also connect to it what from, again, coming back to your uh, predominantly economic vantage point, whether France is uh, an inhibitor or a, a problem in delivering that um, uh, a facilitator or an inhibitor in delivering that economic promise that you, uh, that you described? So I think when we, when we look at the, the Macron presidency, it's clear that one of the, the very strong characteristics of Macron is he's extremely convinced about the value of the European model. Um, we saw the Sorbonne speech where he set out a very ambitious view for Europe uh, covering many different areas and interestingly covering many of the areas that we've been discussing here today ranging both from the economic topics to the geopolitical to the military topics so it's clear that the the current government in France has a very strong view about what Europe should be and I think if we if we look at the European agenda today it's I don't think it's really very easy to say that there's, there's one country or, or one element that's to blame. I would say if we're looking at Europe today, I, I really think it's, uh, you know, I, I like this idea of us being a political adolescent because if we look throughout the process, there are just many areas where we struggle to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And I would say one of the areas that we're, we, we have lost a little bit of is trust amongst the member states. You know, when I think about the international role of the euro, and we heard it mentioned many times this morning, I think a safe European asset is a key building block. Being able to have a, a, a well-functioning banking union, a true capital markets union, but all of those elements depend on, on handing over some form of sovereignty. They depend on some level of risk sharing, some level of risk reduction as well. And I think it's about rebuilding that trust between the member states that's absolutely critical. Now, if we think about trust, that can take an awful long time to rebuild. So I think what we have to do is rather than hoping we can rebuild it, is to have the courage to trust each other and to move ahead very, very quickly. 
My concern as an economist is that over the coming years, we will face another economic downturn. And I don't think we should expect the US nor China to be in, in the mood to address this in a, in a multilateral framework. And as such, it really will be up to Europe to have the strength. So from the perspective of France today, and I, France is my adopted country, as anyone in this room who's heard me speak French will know very clearly. Um, you can see my name is quite Nordic in its nature. But I, I strongly believe in the European model. I strongly believe in what Europe can deliver. I think that there is a, a shared view in Europe that we need a stronger Europe. And I think what we need to do is be able to compromise and build up. What I would say, though, is I disagree a little bit on the idea that it's only about Paris and Berlin. I think it was true at a time that Paris and Berlin reflected the different views in Europe quite well. I'm not 100% convinced that this is the case today. And I would think that including Rome is very important as well, but also giving consideration to the other European capitals in building this vision. So those would be my thoughts. Yeah, yeah just, just in support of, of uh, Mr. de Hoopschreffer's comments, I think what he meant is that the, the Franco-German tandem is necessary but not sufficient. But correct me if I'm wrong. Well, it, it, I, I think it's, it's, it's a precondition. Uh, we, we, we need, and I mentioned the Hanseatic coalition, I mean the Dutch government, for those who do, don't realize, is, is, is also operating within the Hanseatic format. Which is, which is a format with a few, a few Nordic countries and, and, and Baltic countries, fine. Uh, I mean, you can, you can build any coalition you want. But I think, I think uh, Rem Korteweg, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my point uh, that, that uh, more than ever uh, now uh, uh, our British friends uh, uh, are what I called uh, uh, nearing the end of the debate on their, on their voluntary uh, political suicide. Europe becoming more continental, uh, it, it is essential uh, uh, that, that, that France and Germany agree on the, on the, on the way forward. Uh, so we need French-German leadership. Uh, I mean, I, ca I can't say it more clearly. Uh, and of course, uh, other, other capitals are important, certainly in, in, the, in, the, in the framework of, of capitals uh, like, uh, as, as, as was mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Or Orban in Hungary and the Italian, uh, and the Italian coalition. I mean, we have a very complicated political picture, but bringing the European Union as this unique project we all need forward. Uh, that is why I spoke about China and the US. Uh, in, 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 indeed, of course, not because we have, we have as much with China and with the US. Uh, we share the values with the US very much, uh, although it's from time to time different in these Trumpian times. I, I, I add once again, uh, but I stick to my point that I think, I think the narratives from France and Germany to, to, to give you one brief example, uh, the Sorbonne speech by, by Emmanuel Macron was, was mentioned. The reaction from Germany came, uh, and the German ambassador will correct me when I'm wrong now or, or, or later, came from Annegret kramp karrenbauer and not from the Chancellor. Now, I, I, I can understand. But if you compare those two speeches, you see two different narratives. And that's, what's, and that's, that's what worries me. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go to Professor Hicks um, and ask you, as a professor of political science, could you shed your light on this um, tension in a way that the member states may be more important, whereas in terms of decision-making power, the European Parliament and the institutions are still very, very crucial. Uh, and could you just address this topic of Franco-German um, uh, cooperation in a context of, uh, of the two visions you, you described? And as a Brit, can I ask you to address the Brexit question? Because it has popped up not just once, but twice. Uh, what role should we expect from the UK in the next, uh, in the next uh, institutional cycle? <laughs> How long have you got? Uh, uh, let me first say, on, on the first point there, I, I, you know, my understanding of the history of European integration is at key points in the process, uh, there's a new package deal that gets put together. If we go back to the 50s and 60s, you can think about the package that allowed the creation of the common market. And then if you think about the 1980s, you can think about the package that allowed the creation of the single market alongside the structural funds, minimum social and environment standards. And I, I don't see the emergence of a new grand bargain 
um, that would allow a major step forward that is necessary in, in the things that uh, Michaela was talking about here in capital union, banking union, deeper economic and monetary union, plus also a new major step forward in defense and security. I mean, everybody amongst ourselves, we can all agree this is what Europe needs, both for its security, its global projection of power, its, its economic efficiency internally. But I don't see the, the elements of the grand bargain that would allow 27 member states to actually come on board now in such a heterogeneous, such a pluralist polity that we now have, far more heterogeneous than in the 50s, far more heterogeneous uh, than in the 80s and 90s. And I, when I say heterogeneous, I mean heterogeneous in terms of policy preferences or policy positions over economics, security, global questions. Um, this is the concern that I have. Uh, in terms of how Britain fits into this, I think right now in the UK there's an obsession with what's going to happen in the next few days, the next few weeks, the next few months, whereas and I, I don't see and I find frustrating a vision of a relationship between the UK and the EU for five to ten years from now. And I, I, my, the vision that I would like to see is, is the UK and the EU as very close partners. And I, I often use the analogy of Canada and the United States. Of course, the, the balance is slightly different between Canada and the United States and the UK and the EU, but, but the spirit of it should be the same. Very closely integrated markets, global security partners, in, in whether it's uh, in climate change, in global trade, in fighting terrorism, in data sharing, in defense cooperation. I mean, I think this, the Britain will go through the pain of leaving the EU, but we will immediately start to rebuild all of the, a lot of the connections we had because the whole reason, the economic, the political and the security reasons why we were in the EU in the first place are not gonna go, are not gonna go away, they are still there. And so there will be new rebuilding of closer economic, closer social relations. And here I speak as a professor in a university, um, but equally close defense relations. And I can imagine a, a, an annual EU-UK security summit, for example. So I, I would like both the, from the EU side and the UK side to, to set out a positive version of a vision of a partnership between the EU27 and the UK five to ten years from now. And I don't see that emerging. Thank you very much. And with that, um, our time has run out, unfortunately. Uh, so I am just going to take uh, a minute or two to um, thank you, uh, all four of you, for, for sh sharing your insights with us. Over the past hour, we've moved from um, the geopolitical uh, uh, framework and the challenges that Europe faces being squeezed in the proverbial nutcracker between China and America to a discussion on the necessity to, for Europe to get its act together to uh, ha the challenges in a new European Parliament where it will be more difficult to find working majorities where there are tensions and difficulties in terms of how to get the member states up and running the crucial role that uh, a Franco-German cooperation plays um, and uh, with some Brexit sprinkled on top and, and, and with that, again, I, I, I want to thank our four speakers. I want to very much thank the organizers for making it possible to have debates like this uh, about the future of Europe, covering areas from financial economic issues all the way up to uh, uh, grand strategy and geopolitics. And uh, as a think tanker, I am, I am comforted by the thought that also private sector players, such as banks, are willing to play that role in making debates like this possible. And with that, uh, I think this wraps up the European element of our program and everyone will continue the discussions inside their uh, national capitals or national, national sort of formats. So th th thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ram, thank you very much. Please stay seated. Uh, that was, that was Immensely interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Rem, for moderating. And would you be so kind to be now uh, one of the speakers in the panel? I should sure, change, sure. change your behavior a little no, I'll bit. I'll change my behavior. Yeah, change your behavior. Um, uh, 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 Mr. Jatops, Heffer, you will uh, stay on board, of course. And before we go on, we, we, we would like to continue to our last guest, our last panelist of today. He's the German ambassador to the Netherlands. We are very glad that he's joining us today as well. Let's show a huge thank you for Mr. Dirk Bengelman. Please come forward. Go in the middle. 
<laughs> you can well, you can sit in the middle, and I'll change just a little bit because on this way, like that. <laughs> That's very nice of yeah, 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 right. <laughs> so, used to be my boss, but uh, <laughs> some years ago. <laughs> right, uh, Mr. Bengel, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. You've been watching the previous panel. Do you do you do you have any thoughts uh, on the subjects that came up during this discussion? Yeah, I think what we have heard here again is this uh, dilemma which we're in that in, in the European Union we would actually right now need more cohesion and more strength in order to be able to cope with these international challenges, mm -hmm. particularly posed by the two nutcrackers, uh, as I recall, <laughs> <laughs> the verbatim. Uh, but the reality is that whilst we long for that, we are busy with retrograde things like the Brexit, uh, which keeps us very busy, takes a lot of time and political energy. And let's not uh, belittle that. We have a lot of centrifugal uh, powers at play as mm -hmm. well. So the squeeze, as somebody mentioned it here, is there in many respects. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think... And now I perhaps a look to my own country. These challenges are so manifold uh, that at this stage we are busy on the European front, but also when I come to my own nation, we are looking at elements like the climate and energy. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, they, I've seen the eight uh, leaders, including Prime Minister Mark Rutte in Sibiu yesterday. Germany uh, was not part of the eight. But it's also true that we're having a debate in Germany about the future of the climate because there is a lot of criticism that we need to do more and quicker. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, we have just had a decision to go or forego, I think you would rather mm -hmm. say, forego nuclear power. No, we made a decision we will forego coal. So for some who are with nuclear power, it may be a little bit easier to, to, to jump forward than those who make decisions on foregoing all of these right. at the same time and yeah. just go for renewable energy. But it's a big challenge, uh, but we are very much aware of it, and, and yeah. we may be a little bit slower, but we will come. And uh, yesterday, <laughs> Mrs. Merkel said in Sibiu she's not against that proposal. Right. She actually agrees right. to parts of it, but she wouldn't be able to sign to the dotted line. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, and I think that's also something which the Dutch would uh, very much appreciate, the German impetus is always, we agree to something, it's written here, that are the numbers, and now we actually want to be able to show that we were able to fulfill mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, the other point is the digital thing is big for my country now, yeah. it's big for Europe now, it's a right. global issue. But in Germany it's even more particular, because we come to a situation now where digitalization will enter the production world. Right. Germany is a country with a lot of production and it will be the bet on whether or not we are able to turn around on digitalization when it comes to what we call industry 4.0. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, yes. that will be our bet. Many countries have other bets. I think that will be our bet. Right. And then there was a lot of comment on the, the situation vis-a-vis -vis leadership. German Franco need to work mm -hmm. together. I agree with that. And uh, we will, I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. But vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, German role, you know, in Munich, uh, three years, was it three or four years back, our political leaders uh, made a lot of comment on that. The debate has started, but it is still, it is still, and I say that as a German citizen now, it's still that many Germans are very reluctant when it comes to that point, right. which you might call hard power or... Mm -hmm. Using and, hardcore power, we are still have that be, be, reluctance. Because this this uh, this point, uh, our uh, Dutch minister, uh, finance minister Volker Hoekstra, made yeah. that point pretty uh, eloquently uh, this week, I think, uh, at his speech in Germany, where he said, "Well, German Germany should be more active and more self-assertive on on the world stage." Could you elaborate a little bit why Germany is that hesitant then? What, what is that? And it, uh, you know, this uh, sounds like a new debate. I've been in the foreign office for 30 years and I can tell you <laughs> I've written a lot of papers about problems in the German-Franco relationship. Uh, and I have also written a lot of papers about why is it that we are so reluctant. So right. we are in a story which is developing over a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have moved forward. Uh, when you look at the missions which the Dutch have, 
uh, around the world, you will find that they are basically, wherever they are, we are there too. Mm -hmm. We are actually there together. Mm -hmm. So we have moved outside of our comfort zone, but admittedly, sometimes with more reluctance and right. sometimes with less military hard power. Uh, uh, Mr. Yatov, can I have one, one yeah, point? Sure. <laughs> Which is, Take your that time. is, when I talk to my people back home, they hear these noises or these sounds, many Germans would still tell me, ah, do you think they really mean it? Ah. What if we do more? There is a strong feeling in Germany that when those particular, if I may say so, coming more from the East, uh, Radek Sikorsky, I remember, when those who ask us for more leadership, yeah, but not too much. Mm. It's Germany. Right. Well, Mr. Dobbs-Schreffer, maybe you can um, persuade uh, the countrymen of, <laughs> uh, of, of, of Mr. Brengel. And how would you do that, then? Uh, let, let, let me start by saying that, that the, the many times I'm, 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 I'm in Germany, also speaking there, I, one, one always has these discussions. And it's, it's remarkable, and I add, I add understandable, uh, but remarkable uh, that also the younger generations uh, feel as the ambassador just indicated. Uh, so there, there's not a rupture, there's not a clean, a clean break between the, between no. the generations. And I, I can understand, uh, but when I make, make my remarks about, about Germany and the, and, and the need, also from a Dutch, very Dutch national perspective, for German leadership, Franco-German uh, German leadership, uh, it, it, it is also, uh, I, I also refer, I mainly refer also in the security and defense domain, but I'm, I mainly also refer in what way, what should be the route the European Union is going, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what direction the euro is going uh, on, on issues like, as discussed this morning in, the, right. in this room, the capital market union and the, and the, and the banking union, and, and, and there I see a lot of light between Paris and, 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 yeah. and, and Berlin. Uh, climate, the, the ambassador has referred to, have, have, has referred to, clim uh, to, to, to climate. I still wonder, but that's another discussion, if, if we can uh, make the transition to uh, renewables. Uh, but, but uh, can I interject for a second? Yes, sure. but, um, isn't waiting for Paris and Berlin to agree on such a grand vision, isn't that waiting for something Godot. that's not going to happen? Waiting for Godot. No, uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. And I, I, I think, as 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 Hoekstra tried to do, the Dutch finance minister. I, I, I think nations like the Netherlands and, and many others should contribute to this debate and feed their thoughts into into Paris and Berlin. Build other coalitions. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know uh, that that Germany is not Germany for that matter is not unhappy with the Dutch and this Hanseatic coalition. Mm -hmm. Uh, for political reasons, I can I, I can I can I can understand. They'll not say so publicly, but they but but but, but maybe you are. can, Mr. Bengelman. Hanseatic coalition, do you like that? Oh, I don't want to interrupt. Mr. <laughs> 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 Far from me. <laughs> anyway, you, you, one, one, one more sentence. You, yeah. you you can you can you can feed your thoughts into right. into Paris and and, and Berlin. And for the Dutch, I, I think more specifically, uh, in, 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 in the, the Netherlands, very simply said, is a, is, a, is a horizontal society. France is a very vertical society, so the Dutch and the French all, always have, uh, let, let's say, more, uh, they need more energy to see each other in, into the eyes. The Dutch and the Germans do not. I mean, those societies, uh, the, the Rhineland model and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I, still, I still think uh, uh, that, that we should continue doing right. so. Uh, I understand the internal political situation in Germany very well. Uh, a, a change of a chancellor, elections, right. coalition. Anyway, right. we know that. Okay. Um, Rem, I, I just wanted to go to you and then back to Mr. Bringerman, but you as a moderator just right now, you, you can't always speak your mind. Not always. Nay, no. Not always. So, <laughs> but he so does. You're, 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 but, now, but now you're a panelist. So in which part of the previous discussion did you really have to bite your lip? <laughs> I, I, what I mean, a fair question. No, uh, <laughs> see, the, the, the thing is, there is a lot to agree to. There is a lot to agree to in terms of what challenges Europe currently faces. Uh, and, but but, but I, I want to take a slightly different approach. And that's one of the things that concerns me, which I see very clearly, 
is that Europe today, and Europe is not is the EU, but also individual member states, we're, we're in a period where we are playing defense. Right. We're playing defense in terms of trade, on preserving the WTO. We're playing defense in terms of a lot of institutions that are now under threat, yeah. which we built over the past 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, and this requires a change of approach. Right. Because we developed the European Union, and we always sort of bought into Frank Fukuyama's uh, uh, um, thesis right. that you know, what we were creating in Europe was you know, mm -hmm. the next best thing that's going to happen to everyone else. And apparently, not just is it that that's not the case, because we see alternative models like the Chinese model really mm -hmm. challenging our liberal model, but also internally we have people mm -hmm. saying, well, this isn't necessarily what we want. And so it's forcing us into an uncomfortable position that we're, not, not, um, that we're, that we're on the defense. And right. we don't really know yet how to do it. And this leads me to my second point. Where we see this most clearly and most pronounced is in the changing relationship with the United States. And mm -hmm. I, I wholeheartedly agree with what Mr. De Hoopschreffer said. I mean, this is, this is a sea change moment. This is, we cannot sort of overestimate how important it is that the country that we relied on for the past 70 years, not mm -hmm. just for our security, but just no. in building the institutions. 70 years. So, yes, yeah, 70 yeah, 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 years. Yeah, 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 I mean, we're yeah. celebrating 75 yeah. Yeah, years right, next yeah, year. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, that, that, that they have a fundamentally different approach under right. this current administration. Right. I, I was in Washington on, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. They are confused by what's happening in Europe. But the bottom line of what people are saying there is, you know, it's actually pre tactically quite smart what the Americans are doing. They are playing this bilateral card, and they are getting their way. They are seeing Poland going outside NATO, making yep. separate security guarantees. They are able to leverage some of their individual bilateral relations with, con with countries like Hungary and, with, uh, uh, and, and probably with Italy. But it's strategically super stupid on the side of the Americans. And what we need to do is we not just need well, to hold why, each other. Why is it strategically super stupid? Because Trump is pretty, pretty happy with himself. Because ultimately, I'm sort of echoing <laughs> what Mr. Dobbs Heffer was saying, ultimately the Americans at some point will realize that in a multipolar world there are limits to um, strong arming others. Mm -hmm. They will run into limits with respect to the, 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 they need friends to work with them on their great power competition with China. And they will find that they have no stronger friends or allies than the Europeans. But the problem is that here the debate is changing. It's becoming much more anti-American. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hopefully forcing Europe to, to get its act together on a right. number of things, mm -hmm. but it will go at the expense of something that has really undergirded our prosperity, our peace, and our, and our I, I think, in a way, also our freedoms here in this part of the world. Right. So, you, 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 uh, Mr. De Hoopschreffer, you, you mentioned the bilateral trap, you mentioned the nutcracker. I just found on Twitter a, a, a cartoon from uh, Jos Collignon. I thought, well, that's a nice one to really no. uh, uh, learn just a second uh, there. Is it there? Is it there, guys? Oh, hopefully it's there. There he is. Like, yeah, this, this is actually the nutcracker. I saw this on Twitter. Uh -huh. You don't want to ever close a union. No, go away with Brussels. Yeah, stay sovereign. Yeah, this is the Euro European uh, voter right now. So this is well, maybe an interesting picture. Um, so if we talk about this bilateral trap, if we talk about the, this changing um, a face of, of, of geopolitical uh, issues. Uh, what is the way forward? So, so if, for instance, uh, China. So, Mr. Robschreffer, you mentioned China. Uh, Mr. Brengelman, what, because we should be more assertive towards China, I think. But the other hand, um, well, what, would, what would our stance against China be? Because I'm a little bit confused. Uh, On China, I would actually make the point that uh, uh, the Chancellor was always very clear in her discussions with China and if there has been somebody who has a, a certain history of being very clear with the Chinese leaders and I would say the Chinese leaders actually respecting that I think it is actually our relationship mm -hmm. um, but you made I don't remember who made that point uh, with uh, what, what kind of challenges this relationship puts to us the, the Secretary was talking about the different attitudes we have with these different powers. And indeed, it is quite remarkable that, as a matter of fact, right now, when we talk free trade, when we talk uh, Paris, etc., there are some who are closer to us mm -hmm. than the one we always thought we, we would for always be closer to. Right. So that isn't, is a factual observation. 
But the real challenge when it comes to China for our societies is indeed that it seems, and Mr. Orban would say that very openly, it's a, a good cooperation for us because they actually support our notion of what he calls a liberal democracy. But it seems to be successful. That is a challenge to us, mm -hmm. uh, to our way of thinking. But let me come back to, to the issue of how we deal with Chinese. I think we, we always have had a very clear line with them. They uh, respect uh, the German industrial cloud. Okay, I know it's, uh, it's not context-free, so to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was also very much uh, to be seen lately, uh, I think it was two or three weeks ago, when they had their s uh, separate meeting, I think it was still 16 plus one, and then uh, President Macron uh, and uh, Mr. Juncker and Chancellor Merkel would meet with them in Paris and made it very clear for that relationship we expect the Chinese to also accept that we have a certain way of how we organize ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that message was pretty clear. All right. I think apart from that, I see your debate in this country and the debate in Germany on many of these things very much in parallel, whether it is the strategy. Uh, Budikova was making a fair point. The, the BDE actually came out with a strong China strategy, and it's marvelous for me to see that a green would actually uh, yeah. highlight the BDE <laughs> rapport. Uh, you see, also yeah. their things have changed a little bit. Uh, we have the same debate like you have on 5G, mm -hmm. on Huawei, right. etc. So we are all in the same boat. And right. again, that shows we really need to be together to grapple right. that. Yeah, and the thing is, in all these discussions, of course, there's so much nuance. But maybe in debates, sometimes nuance doesn't help us. So. Um, I'm going to go for you, Rem. Oh, uh, yeah. So, should we look at China then as a friend or a foe, or is that is that is that an unfair question? I mean, there's something in between which is called a frenemy, which is you. So I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <What>? Wait a <laughs> second. A frenemy. A frenemy. <laughs> right. I, I mean, you. So, I like your ex-wife or something. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> We, we have to develop a, a different approach to China as we had over the past decades or so. Right. Because if we had a relationship with, no, uh, phrase it slightly differently, we need an approach to Asia. Right. Our approach to Asia seems to be reduced to a China approach. Mm -hmm. And that China approach was always reduced to a commercial or primarily economic approach. Right. Now, on the one hand, it's good news that we see changes to our China strategy that we take national security considerations more into account. Um, but it needs to be also encapsulated in a different approach to Asia. I mean, China, Asia is more than just China. We need better relations with Japan that also include this dialogue on what's happening in their region in terms of security. Mm -hmm. We need a better relationship with, with, with the Indians. I mean, God forbid we need to start talking with the Russians about China because if not, we run into this problem of perhaps a self-fulfilling prophecy, which a lot of strategists are warning about, that you have the bear and the dragon holding each other very close against the West. Mm -hmm. And that would probably be the worst of both worlds. There are a lot of structural reasons why that's not going to happen very soon, mm -hmm. but the Putin-Xi relationship is something to keep an eye on. Right. We need to at least start talking with the Russians about how they see China and, and how we see them. Do, do the Russians not have worries about 5G and Huawei? I mean, they're very security conscious. I was in Moscow the other day. There is Huawei everywhere in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So there, there are areas that, despite our, our sanctions package, that we can talk with the Russians about. Um, and, and in that context, so a China strategy, which our current, minister, minist our current government is uh, working through, sounds nice, but it, 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 it has to be encapsulated in, in, in basically an integral whole of government approach because China is relevant on so many files. So right. you cannot simply say, this is the China desk, they do the China strategy, that's <laughs> fine. No, we need people in our America desks that work on China. We need people in our Japan desks, in our India desks, in the Ministry of Economic Affairs. I mean, this is right. the new game in town. Right. Mr. Robsheffer, your point of view on this. On the, on the Americans and the remarks Mr. Kotler made, I, I think uh, even Trump will find out that the Americans have a destiny to lead. You now see it in the, in the Iran uh, dossier, the GCPOA. Uh, Trump sends an aircraft carrier 
uh, and, 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 and bombers. Uh, l l let's hope that, that, that he's not going to do anything with them. But the United States of America, which, which Trump, which, who thinks that he can stay away from the world scene, I think makes, makes, makes a, a terrible mistake. Uh, wherever there would be serious trouble in the world, the Americans would have to lead because mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in, their, in their interest to lead. On, on, on China, I, I, I said in my speech, uh, and this morning uh, the Dutch government was meeting on the, on the China strategy, as, as, I'm, uh, as, as, as I heard. On, on, on China, uh, uh, we have to think, as I said, long term. Democracies do not think long term. Mm -hmm. Democracies are by definition short term. Right. Integrated. We do not think integrated. The Chinese think integrated. BRI, as I, as, as I mentioned, is financial, economic, cultural, what, 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 what have you. Uh, and, and point number three, uh, it has not yet been mentioned, but we should not give up if we talk about the European Union as a union of values, that we continue to have a dialogue with China on human rights. Uh, Rem Kortewerk was quite rightly uh, men, men, mentioning uh, the, the, the values and the, and, the, and, the, and the discussion with China. If we only went for the commercial, now we realize it's a, it's a, it's a wider political game, mm -hmm. indeed, Indo-Chinese, Indo Asian, right. Asian Chinese. Uh, but uh, if I think about one million plus Uyghurs in Xinjiang who are sitting in, 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 in camps, mm -hmm. we, we cannot in the China strategy simply right. abandon. Uh, if, if, if we stick to our values, the human rights mm -hmm. dialogue, we also have to, uh, and, and there again, I must side with Ambassador Brengelman, there, Angela Merkel, uh, as, as I have experienced her in my career, uh, never, shies, never shies away from, from mentioning privately and publicly. Right. Uh, because bef bef before you know, uh, we see that a bit in Saudi Arabia, of course, mm. as well, we, we totally forget uh, about, about the human rights dialogue. Right. And for me, that's an integral part. All right. I, I want to follow up on the, on the thesis that's right here, uh, a little bit on the screen. Uh, and that, that is about competitiveness. And I want to talk a little bit about scale of companies as well. Um, because, well, first let's talk about investments. For instance, China has come up several times, but America as well is, are splashing massive amounts of investments into AI, artificial intelligence. We as Europe are lagging behind. We've heard Emmanuel Macron uh, 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 give some great speeches about that. Um, is that, is, is, well, uh, Mr. Bringerman, is that a worry to you that we are lagging behind on investments, for instance, for such a strategic uh, uh, element as, as AI is going to be? Yeah, it is a concern. And uh, unfortunately, a little, we were a little bit re in uh, retard, en retard mm -hmm. on this debate also in Germany, to be honest. And uh, I think the, uh, the most uh, widely used criticism in Germany these days uh, against politics is that, for example, when it comes to digitalization, what we call in German Breitband uh, is still lacking in Germany. Mm -hmm. And people start saying, you know, you were, I would say that, resting on your laurels when right. it comes, yeah. for example, Ooh. to the car industry. And uh, now they realize they need to hurry up. Mm -hmm. They do. But it was obviously a little bit late in the day. Yeah. So yes, there, there was perhaps this aspect of resting on our laurels on some of these things. But I believe the people now have realized that we need to turn around. We, but we are coming from behind. Mm, yeah. And do we have time and money and willingness to get in front of this game? Because if you see how fast that is going in China, how fast the Americans are picking up this, I'm like, I, I don't have any idea if, if we're ever going to win this game. What's your opinion on that? I'm, you know, I was working before I went uh, back to bilateral diplomacy, both at NATO and later in the cyber world. Right. And I share your concern. Mm. Whatever we did, uh, others already did a little right. bit faster. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it is a hapless situation. But we need to speed up. Money is there, I believe. The political will should be there. All right. So let's talk about how big European companies can become. Um, we just, well, of course, the, uh, I think you mentioned it already before, the Siem Siemens Alstom uh, merger was forbidden by Brussels. Now, today, ThyssenKrupp and the European branch of Tata uh, mm -hmm. is not going to happen. Um, partly because of European concerns. Deutsche Commerce. Um, voilà. Yeah. Are we, and, and that's all because of 
Brussels rules on competition. Are we naive in that? Um, uh, that's a really tough question. I, 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 don't, I don't know whether we're naive. Uh, we have a particular rule book yeah. that we adhere to. And that's a, 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 a rule book that serves us well inside the internal market. The question is to what extent you can export those rules. Uh, or whether we should have a different set of rules when it comes to companies that, uh, that want to compete internationally. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of two minds because there's a real risk once we say, okay, it's good to have these European, these European champions. Right. But a European champion is probably going to mean a French or German champion mm -hmm. or an Italian one. And perhaps there are some crumbs left over for some Rough. of the others. Yeah. And this is the tension. Right. This is the tension. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, I really, I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I have a clear, clear view on this, but that's at least sort of the dilemma that I, that I, that I see unfolding. Right. Well, well Mr. Jaapschreffer, because when we heard about the Siemens Alstom, the, the, the newspapers in the Netherlands were full of, well, the Chinese will, will be laughing right now. And, and for mostly the Chinese train maker C, CRRC, they're like, oh, yeah, well, no competition in Europe. That's great. So Rem is a little bit on both sides. What's your, yeah, what's your well, take? I, 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 I wrote this down in my brief introduction uh, because of exactly the same reason. Uh, I, I, I can't say we should do it, but looking at the Chinese, uh, I, I, I think we should have a very critical look uh, if the rules still, because Fersteia has, of course, applied the rules. I mean, yeah. you can't blame her for no. blocking the Siemens Alstom uh, uh, merger. But I, th I think uh, two, two, two things. I think, first of all, uh, uh, on, 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 on an adjacent topic, I think, uh, and that discussion, if I'm well informed, has started. We need, where it goes uh, about vetting Chinese investment, uh, mm -hmm. I think we, we need a sort of CFIUS, which the uh, mm -hmm. United States has, where they vetting investment. I spoke to one Dutch former minister uh, yesterday uh, who has a lot of, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a farmer in France, he said you cannot imagine how much land the Chinese are buying in, mm -hmm. in, in, in France and elsewhere. Yes. I, I would like a system, uh, uh, and for that matter perhaps also an institution like CFIUS, where we can vet right. uh, uh, Chinese projects, because now it is bilateral trap, now, now, now it is, uh, they, they go in anywhere. Uh, from Trieste to, mm -hmm. to land in, in, in France, so that, that's, that's point number one. Point number two, indeed, the trains uh, and, and uh, what, what to do to prevent that in, in, in a few years' time the Chinese come in, come in with high-speed trains at one-third of the price uh, right. uh, we, we can make them in Europe. And the Chinese, I think, over the past two or three years uh, have built 20,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. Uh, and, and we certainly and here in, in the Netherlands, yeah. I mean, we took 10 years about, about a mile, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? So uh, I'm also, like, like I'm caught in two minds, I, 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 I don't dare to say here uh, we, we should change the rules, but I wonder if in the long term we can, we can keep the competition going with the Chinese uh, and, and with others for that matter, right. without vetting one and with, without having a good look at the rule book. Right. Can, can I, can I yeah, just chip? Yeah, sure. I, mean, I, I think this is really one of a, a, a very important topic, that, but that also requires uh, sort of economist to chip into. So, so it's kind of difficult to ask uh, mm -hmm. uh, a historian <laughs> like myself to, 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 to make an assessment on this. But where I think that Yapto Obsefer is, is, um, is very right is that the way I phrase it is that there's an element of reciprocity that needs to be built into the system. Reciprocity to the extent that when Chinese investors or sellers want to access the European market, it should come with reciprocity in terms right. of our market access under mm. similar rules to the Chinese market. Right. Seems like a no-brainer. And what we haven't seen over the past decades is this, actually since the China joined the WTO, yeah. is a level playing mm -hmm. field. I mean, the rules are there. The rules are there, but mm -hmm. they're not adhered to. I mean, there's no country with which Europe has as many trade conflicts as with China. Right. And it's all about market access. It's all about technology transfer. It's the technology transfer from Siemens for, for, the, for, for a high-speed rail, which is now leading Chinese companies to be able to undersell Siemens in our own market. And that's where I think applying the rules right. would be much more useful. Right. Mr. Bringemann, there is 
there are several, but this is, this is uh, I'm a pretty fan of that company. It's a German company, and they are absolutely astonishing in robotics. And you know them, they're KUKA. Yeah. And they've been bought by the Chinese. Do the Germans regret that move? That we can't say yet, because we don't know what eventually will then be the, the end story. But it was this KUKA story which actually brought up this discussion in Germany, yeah. which is there. You just referred to it. We have that debate. And I think the German government and the German industry are much more watchful on that, if right. I may say it like this. What, and what, there, have been, there have been situations afterwards where you could sense that it has become yeah. more, more careful. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have had some rounds with the Chinese on this particular level playing field recently. There have been uh, some promises that things would become easier. Let's mm -hmm. wait and see. But certainly for us, it was a, a very important point over the last 12 months to, to highlight that point. Right. Uh, by the way, talking about these champions, uh, uh, Rem Korvik just said, or, or, or also Yabdo uh, Sheffer. We, we, we should have some, some leadership here, but, you know, when it comes to companies, maybe they would be French or German. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there's the German <laughs> chancellor laughing in the middle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have the cake and eat it yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, that, that, well, that is exactly yeah, the problem no. that no. we're addressing right now. That if, if we want to be a, a, a competitor on a world scale, some markets in Europe will lose. Mm -hmm. And, if, and, the, and, the, and the, the thing is, will we be okay with that? And if we're okay with that, how are we going to explain that to the markets that are losing? Now, yeah, I don't think it is as easy as that. For example, here in, in my present situation, I observe, uh, let me highlight that because I think not every Dutch is even aware of that. When it comes to the German trading balance, you know who the big four are? I know. Uh, number one, China. Number two, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Before France and uh, the U.S. I don't know in which mm -hmm. order the two. So the Dutch are the number two in our trading balance. So for this, uh, you know, Augenhöhe goes different ways. I think the Dutch shouldn't be too shy about that situation. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and here we have, for example, to take a particular uh, company, ASML in Eindhoven, mm -hmm. They work a lot with what we call uh, Yen Optic, Carl Zeiss, etc. All the optics yeah. come from there, basically. So you do have these situations which perhaps don't look like a merger, but are very good cooperation right. and integration. So, so um, th we should have the discussion, I think, and we had the discussion on how big and how, uh, can we create European champions or not. But coming to this question, what can we do more, Mr. Jaap Scheffer, to to, to reinforce that, that global competitiveness of Europe? Well, my, my first answer would be, and it was, it was given by one of the, one of the, one of the panelists, uh, uh, is, is to invest politically and otherwise in playing by the rules. Mm -hmm. We have the rules. We have to defend uh, that, that famous in, uh, liberal international order where the right of the strongest does not prevail because we have rules. Uh, th that is, of course, our basic debate with the Americans at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is uh, indeed, as Professor Bayama was saying, is a sea change with the times before Trump, right. because the Americans, as, as, as the leading nation, were playing by the rules. Mm -hmm. They are not playing by the rules anymore. And how is that Chinese getting... Chinese are not playing by the rules. How is that getting us more competitive, then? No, by, by, by coming out politically, uh, uh, economically, financially, uh, uh, in, 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 in investing in a policy which makes them play by the rules. Mm. Kortewerk mentioned it. I mean, chi China was admitted into the WTO. That doesn't give China a free hand to, to floor mm -hmm. all, all the rules of the WTO. But, which is and and when, when they do, they should, they should be told. And I, I said in my speech that deliber deliberately, uh, it's not only the United States of America who can mm -hmm. tell the Chinese to abide by the rules. We can, as a European Union, in, the, in a market of 500 million plus, we, we, we can do that as well. We shouldn't shy away from taking responsibility and being a bit bold and, and showing a bit more self-esteem and self-respect right. yeah. in that right. regard. I wanted to do, uh, touch upon one final subject, and that is about data. You mentioned, Mr. Jopter, that, that data is the new gold, and we hear that all the time. And, qu and quite a few people say that. But Every 
different block in the world looks differently at how to work with data. So in China, the data is uh, the government's data, and, and they s will see what they're doing with social credit scores and facial recognition and AI, etc. In the US, data is the business that owns it, and they are monetizing that in, in great ways. And in Europe, the data is ours, us the people. Uh, and that's great, I think, but nevertheless, you will not... Well, that's my thesis right now. If you say the data is ours from the people, you'll never create powerhouses like that are uh, now emerging in the US and that are emerging in China. So, Rem Korteweg, it's, it's, is that data protection mindset in Europe, mm -hmm. is that an innovation motor or is that a wet blanket over innovation and, and creating champions? I, I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. I, China controls data. You, the U.S. commercializes it. We protect it. The, the, but this, I think, is a symptom for what we're seeing in the global trade landscape, mm -hmm. which is fragmentation right. um, along the, the three cores, if you will, of, of the global economy. We are moving towards a global tra trade landscape where regulatory regimes, you are going to have a US regime, a, a European regime. It'll be interesting to see where the UK comes out. Right. I mean, think of sort of chlorinated chicken versus uh, <laughs> access to, uh, to the European market. Um, and, and there will be sort of a, a China or, or Asian regime. And they're going to be different. And it's going to require companies to understand how these different regimes work, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also going to be, I, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing for lawyers uh, to <laughs> yeah, make, yeah, right, yeah, make, yeah. make sense of yeah. all of this. <laughs> but it's it's going to come at a cost to the consumer because fragmentation is going to lead to more expensive products mm -hmm. and services. But this is, I, I think, where we're going to move towards. It's not. It doesn't have to be a problem in terms of companies that use data. Mm -hmm. We already saw some of this. Uh, in the discussion in 2014-2015 over um, the clash between uh, the EU and the United States on uh, data privacy. Right. Uh, this was pr previously captured in the uh, Safe Harbor Agreement and that was considered void after a challenge to the Irish Supreme Court by Max Schrems, the Austrian uh, activist who brought Facebook, who brought a charge against Facebook. Right. The result of that was two things. One was Facebook had to set up servers in Europe, mm -hmm. when it wanted to deal with uh, or wanted to use European user data, in other words, follow the European regime, and it also led to a different governmental agreement between the US and the EU on data sharing. Mm -hmm. I, this is, you work around, you, you, can, you can create fixes for this, right. but it does mean that our presumption that we are moving towards a world where we're going to have less and less trade barriers is just not true. In mm -hmm. fact, we are seeing an increase right. in so-called non-tariff trade barriers, mm -hmm. which, is, yeah. which is precisely this. Right. So I don't see it as a tremendous problem. It's a problem for artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but we already t talked about yeah. that. So yeah. on data, I mean, um, we're going to move towards fragmentation, but not towards complete eradication. All right, All right. Somebody else want to respond on this point, on the data point? No, ju just, just to say, uh, to, to, to repeat that, that what I qualified as the weaponization, misuse of data uh, has as a result, as we've seen already in the US and, and, and elsewhere, that the, the citizen, uh, the voter who we need uh, mm -hmm. for, for our, our European project as well, uh, doesn't dis cannot distinguish between real and fake anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that, is, that is, of course, yeah. uh, a, 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 a major danger. Uh, apart from uh, weaponization of data, uh, weapon systems where no human hand is involved anymore. Right. Now you still have to program them. There comes a time, machine learning, artificial intelligence, yeah. when, the, when the drone uh, has learned itself on facial mm -hmm. recognition uh, who, who, to, who, to, who to fire the missile on uh, in, the, in the tribal areas of Pakistan or, 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 or whatever. And the Chinese use it to keep the, the weakest under control and to keep every citizen yeah. under control. Yeah. Mr. Berryman, you wanted to react to that. Yeah. Uh, Rem Kotovic mentioned Safe Harbor, which is one of the very important stepping stones of that business, uh, specifically transatlantic. And when the Europeans were becoming a little bit restless on the Safe Harbor issue, immediately the Americans became nervous. So it's not that we are completely irrelevant in this, but I take your question as a very relevant one. No, I, I wanted to take the floor again for one other comment, which is the rules-based order 
we right. find that important. Yep. We are ready to invest in that. We, we also need to, to be more assertive about it. But the rule of law is, is the other part of it. Mm -hmm. And then we have internal challenges. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. here yeah. We, have two, we have two things which are basically two sides of, uh, or two sides of the same coin. I, yeah. I, I yeah. don't get it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. These two belong together. And that makes it ever more complicated, but nevertheless still important. So, Mr. Jobs-Heffer, you said uh, if you want to enforce rules, then you have to have a uh, military power as well. Yeah. Uh, or what was that? I no, think no, no, it was no. You. Not, not linked specifically to enforcing the rules, but linked to. I'll, I'll give you a concrete example of what, what, what I mean. Uh, in, in hard power projection, and we had this right. also in the discussion on, on, the, on the position of Germany. Uh, imagine that in the Sahelian zone, where Boko Haram meets Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, mm. uh, meets, meets uh, ISIL or, or ISIS, uh, uh, which, which, which is a key area for migration. Uh, mm. Imagine that all these elements come together, and that, like the French and the UN are doing in Mali, there is a need for a military presence. Mm. Mm. You, you can't go to the, to the Oval Office, ring the bell there, and, and say to the Americans, could you please help us out? Right. Uh, that, that, that is an example, and I could think about more scenarios, where, where hard military power projection and, and not some blue helmets or some police mission would be asked mm -hmm. from Europe, from the European Union. Now you have two strands. You have PESCO, which is, which is the Structured Corporation in Brussels, it should, it should go on, but it is already uh, 24, 25 countries. It's bureaucratic. It's cumbersome. It, sh it, should, it should run its course because it's important for the future of the European Union. And you have Macron, uh, European Intervention Initiative, right. and, and that's bringing the able and willing together. And that, that, is, that, that initiative should have a fair chance, in my, in right. my, in my opinion. Well, Mr. Mr. Uh, Dutch Finance Minister Hoekstra mentioned it in Germany uh, this week. Eh? He said it's rather complicated. Uh, that's his language, uh, and that European countries are not competent enough to defend the continent on itself. Well, that, that's, that's, ah. that's, that's my point. Don't yep. call it the European army, by the way. That's a misnomer, mm -hmm. uh, because the European army presupposes decision-making right. in, in the European Parliament or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That will never happen, mm -hmm. because no parliament, no nation will ever cede sovereignty on sending its young generation into, into battle uh, to, to any institution apart from, the, I mean, right. if you want an right. example of national sovereignty, this is the one. But practical cooperation, uh, uh, as we discussed this morning uh, when we discussed tanks and submarines, practical cooperation, and I think Macron gives an opening, uh, and I hope then, then that the British, yeah. uh, uh, or I, I said a bit cynically, the English perhaps, when the Scots decide to leave at a certain stage, uh, we, we, should, we should have them, uh, we should have them right. as close to that initiative as possible. Well, right. and, it, and it's yeah. interesting that the Minister of Finance should say that countries aren't investing enough in defence. Yeah. And why do you think that that's interesting? Because he well, doesn't Because if you look at the... <laughs> yes, it's an arbitrary measure, 2% of spending on defence. Yeah, right. Of, of GDP. Yeah. But it's a measure. Right. And it, you can track the way governments are doing by looking at that right. fairly arbitrary measure. And there, the Netherlands has, I mean, this government, this Minister of Finance, has you know, pulled the purse in a certain way, but the purse is growing so quickly that what he's yeah. given extra <laughs> really doesn't amount to all that much. In so fact, in the insane. rankings, we're going down. Mm -hmm. So in 2024, we're going to be spending less on defense than we're doing today. Mm. There was a, a silly quote, but still a quote today in one of the German social media saying that Mr. Scholz yesterday announced less German tax revenues to make sure we were <laughs> closer to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. but, uh, yeah. but I think the main point about it is not so much just uh, whether it's this or this number. I think the main point, coming myself also from, from the NATO world, so to say, the main point here is, and we Germans get that criticism, for example, also from countries in the East. This is confidence, Vertrauen. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so in this respect, these numbers are not just perhaps uh, the, the money game. They mm -hmm. also express a political currency. And this right. currency is called Vertrauen. Yeah. Is there somebody with a question in the audience? Somebody would like to raise one, one or two? No? It's okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, somebody with the microphone. There you are. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dirk Brouwer. I work for Shell International. Uh, I have one question for uh, Dr. Korteweg. 
Uh, why do you think it is that the whole discussion on radical uh, institutional reform within the EU faded away a bit? I mean, after Brexit, I know at least from the Dutch government point of view, there was a, a need to reform, not only to become more competitive, but also to you know, address the concerns of the more populistic uh, currents uh, in society. And uh, that, that faded away a bit, and uh, instead, uh, numerous uh, scandals uh, emerged. So what happened? Hmm. Yeah. Um, it, so let me see if I can address that. Uh, thanks for the question, by the way. The, the, before Brexit happened, there was a debate in Europe about institutional reform. Uh, in fact, in many respects, it was part of David Cameron's renegotiation, which preempted the vote uh, on, uh, in, in, in June 2016. And some of the, the, the kernels of reform that I think this government in the Netherlands would actually be very interested in developing further were in that renegotiation statement. I just have to flag one thing. I mean, David Cameron got uh, this exclusion on um, that ever closer union wouldn't hold for the UK anymore. That was one of the results that he was able to bring home. This government now has to accept a parliamentary motion, which was passed two weeks ago, requiring and asking for exactly that. But what happened after the renegotiation and after the Brexit vote is that European countries, the EU 27, basically took um, Brexit to mean, well, we don't have to reform just now. <laughs> Just look at what's happening with the UK. We're just fine being, you know, not the UK. And I think it's going to come back. I think it's going to come All back right. with a vengeance uh, at some point after, you know, the, the Brexit fades away from the headlines. That there is this, um, you know, for many European countries, the EU is an ill-fitting suit. I mean, it looks nice, but it, you know, it's not exactly what we thought we purchased. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, that is a discussion that's going to come back. So it's not just on you know, this question, this quite symbolic nature of ever closer union. It's going to be on, uh, on questions of, of, of freedom of movement, which I don't see going away. I think on, the, on, on, on reviewing Schengen, on, uh, on the whole Dublin process with respect to migration. Many of these files really haven't progressed over the past three years. Um, so the only thing I can do is sort of agree with your analysis that this is, is, this is, this is unaddressed and it's going to be crucial for the next commission to take that serious. Right. Uh, and, and just one, one more mm -hmm. point, and then I'll shut up, is, is the, um, the last commission came in, and Juncker said, this is the last chance commission. This is a, a remark he made in, uh, when was it, 2014. Well, if that was the last chance commission, what is this commission? Right. You know, as we face sort of the largest Eurosceptic bloc in the European Parliament in, 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 in the EU's history, is this sort of the, the last, last chance commission? Is this the really, really last chance commission? Or is this we turn the page and we're actually going to take some of the concerns of European citizens serious commission? Um, and I don't know. No, I, I really don't know. No, no, That's okay. an honest right. question. So we'll, we'll wait on the, what is it, uh, at the end of 26th of April, huh? then, then everybody has well. voted and we know what the European Parliament will look like. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a big red screen here that says time's up. So I want to thank our <laughs> distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for Mr. Diab, Rob Schepper, Dirk Bengelman and Rem Korteberg. Thank you very much. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Um, so we're, we're going to round it off, but we have some final thoughts. Uh, we would like to welcome on the stage the Global Head Regulatory and Inter International Affairs from ING, Diederik van Wassenaar. He has been here whole day and is going to do a management <laughs> summary, <laughs> a management summary. No, no, just take, take your time. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Rens, and um, not only for giving me the floor, but also for um, leading uh, us through this uh, very, very interesting day so very well. So a big hand for uh, Rens de Jong. That's thank my you. first thank time. You. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And um, the good thing is uh, that everybody so far has had that, that screen in front of him <laughs> or her, and I don't. So although I'm the person <laughs> between... Uh, you and or myself and the and the drinks I have I can take as, as much time as <laughs> you want and the traditional way of doing that is or maybe an inverted way of doing that Joseph Haydn made once a very famous symphony and that was the the symphony that 
that uh, ended up with nobody left on stage because they did, did never had a holiday. So we can do it in an inverted way. Those who get bored just get out. And then <laughs> I, may, I might have ending speaking to myself, which is something I enjoy doing anyway. So uh, to, to wrap things up, um, we have had a very, very interesting day uh, with, with very good panelists. I just uh, looked at uh, Sky News and it so appears that uh, Baroness Volkerner has already gone on holiday because she was so exhausted after her panel session with Marieke that she couldn't cope with it anymore. And I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a fine example of what happens if you, if you pit a, a true politician, because that's what she is, against a true economic and see how that, that pans out. And it was a, very, a great pleasure to, to look at that. Now, if you, if you look at, uh, at the history of and, and the future of Europe, because that's what we have been, been doing, it, it always helps a bit to, to look back. And one thing is sure, that uh, over the last maybe thousand years or hundreds, at least long, long period of time, many, in many instances, uh, countries or individuals have tried to unite Europe. And uh, very often, Uniting Europe was done uh, for self-interest or for a, a smaller community interest, and they tried to sort of get the whole of Europe behind that. And, and usually they, they uh, you applied force, real force, hard power, to unite Europe. And we all know, because we can read history, that that didn't work. It usually doesn't work. It didn't work in Russia, where they, they forced a, a huge empire and forged it, and then it broke up because it did, doesn't work to force things, people, cultures to go and work together. But the good thing is, we are here in, an, in a country that is a very fine example of that it can work. Because when we uh, formed the Union of Utrecht uh, in, the, in the 16th century, that was formed between seven independent uh, states, uh, nations, people, uh, whatever, uh, that had fought wars against each other Oh, as, as early as 50 years before that. Uh, but yet they forged a union because of common interest. And the common interest was not only the war against Spain. It was a, an expression, a desire to be free to express thoughts and, or believe. And it was also a common, um, a common uh, opportunity. And the common opportunity was trade. And trade works better if you can trade with partners, and if you can do that together, you can make bigger fleet, you can pay for bigger fleet, and you can and afford to go further away and make more money. And, and that, uh, that uh, republic that was forged, it took about 400 years to make it into something that is now sort of akin to one country. And um, it, this is a, 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 a story about something that, that was created by joint opportunity, joint uh, force, and joint uh, necessity. And I like to think that uh, the European Union is, is on that way as well. It will take time because we are all so very different. And it will also take time because we have different interests. But it is a matter of finding the common interests and the common opportunities. And we have learned today that there are many. There are also common threats, but it works better to find common opportunities when you want to bring things together. We, we talked about climate. We talked about... Uh, cyber crime and on the, on the back of that financial economic crime which is by nature cross-border. We talked about energy transition and trade, migration, financial stability, innovation, digitalization, data and all these things you cannot just do on your own. And what is so very uh, prevalent and what came out of these discussions today that it works so much better if we can do that together. Now, what can we do to achieve that? That was basically my question to Frank Heemskerk, and I have been thinking about that, and I think, of course, what can, what can you all do to bring it together? First of all, Frank's answer was bring more people. So my call to all of you in the room, it is unbelievable that with such a fantastic lineup here and also on screen, it proves quite a challenge to get people together to, to join us for a day like this. So my order for you, and I can only order those who, who work at ING and I can't <laughs> even order you, is to, for Pretty next friend. year, when we do this again, uh, you have all, each of you have to bring at least one friend. And you're worthy participants, and I'm sure your friends will be worthy participants, and especially for, for the young talents at ING that are, are here in force, uh, you will inherit pretty soon, if you have not inherited Europe already, you will inherit it. So better 
opportunity to listen to what, uh, what we think where it is going and then share with us where you think it should be going, because you will inherit it. So that's my, my last bit here. And then, of course, as a, as a bank, uh, we have been talking about the Capital Markets Union, and that is a subject that we have been leaving to Europe for far too long. Well, a market union, a market a regulation of a market can only uh, make sense if there is a market. And there is not a European capital market today. So why would you regulate something that isn't there today? But it's, an, it's a task for us, the banks and the lawyers who work with this, to, to make the banks even work better, and the politicians, to try to forge a capital market. And there are initiatives underway. We, we were talking about the Schulzschein, the German uh, private debt instrument. And from the, on the back of that, we'll be able to build something of a capital market. And then, uh, once that, that there is there, then perhaps we can, uh, we can make a capital market union out of that. Just like the, the common market was, the idea was there, and the, and, the, and the fledglings of that was there before the European Union came about. So, again, let me thank you all very much for your participation, uh, those in the room, those in the panel, you are a representation of everybody who, uh, who joined us earlier today. A very special um, thank you and a big thank you to the technicians who made a fantastic show. I mean, this is fan really, truly fantastic. When I heard about it two years ago, I thought, how can we ever achieve this? Well, this is the second year in a row. <laughs> a big thanks to the uh, ING event team who you, you uh, we always take it for granted that they are there, but I can tell you it's very complex to uh, organize even a smaller session like this. And finally, to my colleague, our colleague, Barbara, who uh, has been doing all this and sweating uh, a lot over and pondering a lot over whether it was going to be a success. I think it was a great success, and thank you.